Hello everyone and welcome to my Bible study on the book of James. Uh, we are studying about the proper perspective towards temptation. Uh, James 1 and 17 says, Then when lust hath conceived, it, bring forth, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Uh, James said, then when? In other words, the next process of sin. Uh, the temptation at its very root. Uh, the goal of the devil's perspective is to awaken a lust within us uh, that has been crucified with Christ. Uh, those evil desires and passion within us that have been made dormant and powerless through our faith in Christ and what he has done for us at Calvary. So whenever you and I are tempted, the battle is not so much whether or not we're going to commit the act of sin. Did you get that? Uh, it's so important. The battle is not so much, oh, am I going to do uh, that act of sin? Uh, that's part of it. Uh, but that's the fruit. Uh, of committing the act of sin is really the fruit of something much deeper. Uh, that's where really where the battle is, whether or not if I'm going to believe the truth or not, believe the truth or am I going to believe a lie? That's really where the real battle is. Uh, Paul mentioned in 1 Timothy 6 and 12, he said, fight the good fight of faith. So that's really where the battle is. Am I going to believe a lie? And if you lose that battle, then you've lost the rest of it. And James said here, and when lust has conceived, and I want to bring something out here when, he, uh, when it says, but then when lust has conceived. And this is where word translation comes in. There is a definite, definite article before the word lust. So literally it's when the lust has conceived. Uh, you follow that? The lust has conceived. Uh, that's interesting because normally uh, when you and I are going through something uh, as a child of God, uh, I'm talking about normally when there's an issue uh, of sin in our life or temptation. Um, uh, we're not, uh, tempted to commit, uh, all sin. Um, you follow that normally, uh, it's in one area. Normally it's in one or two areas that we're being tempted in at that particular moment. Uh, when, uh, we're being tempted in that specific season, uh, in our life, uh, we're not being tempted at one time to being an adulterer, a murderer, a fornicator, a forn uh, fornicator, you know, a thief, a, a bank robber, all at the same time. Uh, it's normally in one area. Uh, so that's the ideal uh, when we're uh, being attacked and tempted in that particular area. And when we believe the lie, uh, this is what happens. Uh, we become impregnated um, with that sin, when we accept the temptation, when we believe the lie of that temptation, that there's life in that sin, uh, that it ultimately that there is life in myself by believing in myself rather than believing in Christ. And all that, uh, and instead of believing in Christ and all that he has accomplished for us, at Calvary. So the believer becomes impregnated with that sin uh, in his spirit uh, and his mind, and it brings forth sin. Uh, in other words, it gives um, birth uh, to sin being carried out. Uh, Matthew 5 and 28, Jesus said, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already uh, in his heart. So even before the physical act uh, is ever committed, they have already sinned, and it actually because the believer has accepted the lie, that there is life and pleasure in it, 
uh, and believe that. And uh, James uh, said here, and when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Uh, literally in this verse uh, where it says uh, sin, there is a definite article there before the word sin. And that um, word sin is a noun. For example, in Romans chapter 6, Paul used the word sin over and over again as a noun uh, with a definite article in front of it. Uh, the sin, you can call it uh, the evil nature, the sin nature, but we're going to use the term sin nature. Stick with that term sin nature. So the ideal is this, when the sin nature, when it is finished, it brings forth death. That means that when the sin nature is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Did you get that? When the sin nature is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Now, James has just through a few verses here, he's gone from the very beginning of it to the very ending of it all. Uh, if the sin nature continues to fully mature and what it all goes back to, and the only way that can happen is by the believer continuing to believe in a lie, that there is life in self. Same exact thing goes back to the original temptation. Same thing that happened with Eve. If the believer continues to believe in the lie of the enemy or the world in the flesh, that there is life in me, well, the sin nature is going to continue to fully mature and eventually will lead to that believer losing their soul. And uh, only God knows that point. Uh, we don't know uh, uh, that God is much more merciful uh, than we are. And uh, thank God for that. And uh, thank God for that. Amen. But, uh, but eventually it will lead to that point. Uh, I want to deal with that word death here uh, for a moment. Um, the word death literally means separation from the life-giving power of God, at least in the verse James is using it here. He is dealing with it in a spiritual realm, uh, not so much in the physical realm. He's not meaning that uh, one is going to physically die. Uh, but he is talking about that uh, which is uh, spiritual. Uh, and death, literally, it means separation from the life-giving power of God. Death, there's something very important about death that we need to understand. Uh, death in our mindset in the Western culture, we normally think of death in a sense the that something doesn't exist anymore. Uh, like somebody has died and they are no longer with us anymore. We think of that. Uh, in reality, they are still existing. Uh, their body is dead. And, and we think of death in that form of non-existent. Uh, that's not really what death uh, speaks of. Death speaks of separation. Uh, there's a separation, a change in relationship. There's a separation from the life-giving power of God. Now, James here can be referring to death either positionally or conditionally. Uh, do you understand the ideal of positionally? Uh, every one of us is a child of God, uh, and James is dealing with believers. We are... Uh, we have a position in Christ. Uh, that, uh, that's our legal standing with God. We're justified. And that never changes as long as we keep our faith in God. But it can change. A person can lose that legal status with God through continued unbelief. And that is brought out in Revelation chapter 3, 
where the church of Sardis, where the Lord said to them, um, if you don't repent, then I will blot out your name out of the book of life. Uh, so that right there means you can lose your legal status, your position with God. And so there is a position we have, and there is a condition uh, on earth that we have. And our position doesn't change. Uh, it doesn't fluctuate. Uh, we're justified. Uh, we're 100% righteous in the eyes of God. And thank the Lord for that. Uh, and that's the way that God sees us. But our condition does change. Uh, so we can experience death uh, positionally. Uh, and if that happens, then you lost your salvation. Uh, you can also, as a child of God, we can also experience a death that is working in us, uh, in our condition. And uh, what that means is that uh, we are experiencing a separation in our walk with God. Uh, there's a separation from the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. Uh, you can say it this way, we are frustrating the Holy Spirit. And when Paul used that term in Galatians chapter 2, uh, in verse 21, when he said, I do not frustrate uh, the grace of God. And that frustrating the grace of God in us, which takes place uh, by again, by the object of our faith changing from Christ to our own self. Uh, that's frustrating the grace of God. It means that the life-given power of the Holy Spirit, that victorious living, um, that victorious giving power of the Holy Spirit is being hindered. Uh, there's a separation. Uh, it doesn't mean a complete separation, but whenever there is a hindrance of life flowing through us, and on the flip side, it means that death is working in us. And a good example of that is in Romans chapter 7 and verse 13. Uh, James may have been uh, using the word death here in the same way that Paul did in Romans 7 and 13. And I'm just presenting this to you just as a thought. But James may have been referring to death in the positional sense, and he may have been referring to it in the conditional sense. And I think both may apply. And this is what Paul in uh, Romans chapter 7 and 13 said, Was then that which is good made death unto me? And he was speaking about the law. Was the law which is good, was it made death unto me? He said, God forbid. In other words, that the law in itself is not bad, but it's my approach to law that is bad. But he said sin, and that's the sin nature, but sin, that it may appear sin, was working death in me. And I emphasize those words there, working death in me. By that which is good, that sin by the commandment became exceedingly sinful. So when Paul used the word death there in Romans 7 and 13, he was using it in the sense of the conditional. And because the sin nature was ruling in my life, and because ultimately in Paul's case in Romans chapter 7, because he was trusting in law, ultimately trusting in himself to be right in the eyes of God by the means of the law. What happened was there was a separation from the life-given power of the Holy Spirit to give him life. And when I say life, I don't mean he didn't have salvation, but I mean giving him the benefits of what Jesus died for us at Calvary. And he found himself experiencing this. He said here he experienced death working in him. 
and all of us in reality have experienced that. That is what we refer to as miserable Christian living. When you're saved and you love the Lord, but you feel on the inside a death that is working in me. I don't feel the Holy Spirit working in me. I do. I know he is there. I love the Lord and I know God is there, but I feel death working in me. And again, the very root of it all, the reason for that is, is it all goes back. We will either believe the truth or believe a lie. Again, it all goes back to the original temptation. The difference that maybe Paul was dealing with in Romans chapter 7, where Paul was dealing with law. You could say Paul was dealing with the good side of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That which looks good appears good. It's the law of God. That's good. Where James in chapter 1, and we will see this in James chapter 4, James was, was dealing uh, with more of the evil side of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You have the religious side of it and you have the secular side of it, the worldly side of it. And temptation for us as a child of God, it really comes in those two ways. There's a religious side of it. You can sanctify yourself and here's a program, here's a scheme, here's a method. I've got five steps to three ways, to three keys to do it. You can do it yourself. Here it is. That's the good side of it. That's the religious side of it. But there's a secular side of it as well, which is, you know what? Um, I really don't need any. I don't want the program. And I really don't even want God. I just want to live my life. That's the secular side of it. The worldly side of it. The evil side of it. Both of them is really evil. Because God said to Eve, he said, the day you eat of it, you shall die. So if you use law as a means of righteousness, you're going to die. And if you use world, worldliness as a means, as the means of life, you're going to die. And the only way that you can live is by using the tree of life as the means of life. And that's Christ and what he has done for us at Calvary. He's the tree of life and the cross is the tree of life. And by faith in that, that's the only way that you and I can live. That's the truth. So that's really where the battle is. What are we going to believe in? What are we trusting in? In that moment of temptation, and let me break it down a little more. In that moment of temptation, what will you believe in? And let me say this, that there are some people uh, that think just because that they are believing and trusting the way that they should, etc. That when they are faced with temptation, that they're just not going to give in to it. Uh, they're not going to give in to temptation. And I believe that there is some truth in that. Uh, but get this, just because you're trusting and your faith is in Christ, and all that he has done for us. Leading up into temptation. Which you and I never know when that time is. By the way. We can't plan temptation. Even if you and I are trusting and believing. Leading up to temptation. That does not guarantee that we will never give in to temptation. Um, if that has been presented to you, understand this, that that is not reality. That is not reality. Because the next time you fail, that just proved that teaching to be wrong. So it is appropriate 
It is right for us to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. But that doesn't mean at that moment that your faith is not going to be tried and you won't give in. Uh, so in that moment of temptation, that is where the battle really is. Will I believe or will I not believe? Will you believe in who Christ has made you and who you are in Christ and what Christ has done to you? Uh, he's made us a new creation. And we can say, I don't need that because I've got everything I need in Christ and praise the Lord for that. Uh, so I just say to you, anchor your faith in Christ and keep it there in God he will see you through uh, and that concludes my lesson on James 1 uh, and 15 God bless